As you're probably aware, we are more than halfway uh, through this course. This is the sixth week of class. And among other things, that means we are starting in on chapter four today in lectures concerning uh, sensation. There's something in the syllabus, the student just asked me about this, uh, concerning extra credit uh, earned by doing uh, experiments in the social science uh, lab. And apparently Sonus Systems calls hours of credit points. Uh, so the important thing is that instead of uh, going for four hours of credit or whatever our uh, syllabus says, go for four points of credit. That gets multiplied by one and a half by yours truly to make six uh, possible points. I believe that's our uh, total possible extra credit points by that method. So just an aside. A uh, second uh, administrative type thing, discussion sections have started up again. So please attend your discussion sections. Our teaching assistants are doing their best to make them uh, informative uh, for you and so uh, improve your learning experience. So please do show up. And remember, if you are enrolled in a section that's a little bit awkward to attend for whatever reason, hey, you can go to some other discussion section, uh, no problem. Uh, so before I start in on uh, this first part of chapter four, does anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Questions? Questions. Okay, well, I'll start in then. Uh, how many people have looked at chapter four? Oh, there's some hands out there, good. Well, I would definitely recommend doing this. A large part of the uh, final exam will be drawn from this chapter and the next. So it's a good thing to start early in terms of studying. So we're gonna start out uh, today with a little bit of uh, dead white guys who uh, have studied sensation, you'll, you'll have a number of portraits one after the other. Uh, and then we will start talking about particular senses. Some of the senses will receive more emphasis than others. Uh, these are vision and hearing in particular, but I'll also be talking somewhat about uh, the chemical senses, olfaction. What is olfaction? Smell. Smell. And gustation, which is? taste. Uh, the other senses will get short shrift, I'm afraid, but we'll talk about the chemo senses at least. Uh, whether I get through the uh, sense of smell today, I'm not certain. It depends how rapidly I speak. Uh, but before we go there, we have to talk about the uh, sort of philosophical uh, underpinnings of the study of sensation, and then we'll talk about uh, some methods that people have developed to study uh, the relationship between our senses and the physical stimulus. So without further ado, uh, what are the origins of knowledge? How is it that we come to know things? Uh, and you can probably imagine, given that this is a uh, psych course, that uh, people have come up with two uh, ways in which we might have knowledge. And one of these is knowledge is acquired through experience and this goes uh, by the name of nurture in nature versus nurture uh, arguments. And in philosophy, this is known as empiricism. It's sort of a variety of thought, and that variety of thought, empiricism says, well, knowledge is acquired through experience. And most people would say, sure, there's plenty of knowledge acquired through experience. But there's another side, and we know this as uh, nature, in the nature versus nurture, uh, 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 dichotomy. Well, knowledge is innate and nativism uh, holds that point of view and it says, well, we are born with certain kinds of knowledge and we uh, employ these as we go about our daily business. And there's no question that there are certain forms of knowledge uh, that are innate or native to us. So we'd like to go briefly through this. First we'll start with empiricism. And John Locke is an early proponent of the idea that when one is born, uh, the mind is in fact blank. There's nothing in it. There's this tiny little infant and it doesn't know anything. So effectively, uh, its mind is a blank slate. And a blank tablet is known as a tabula rasa. That's an example of a uh, important Latin phrase for you philosophers out there. A tabula rasa, there's nothing there. It's a blank slate. And then the question is, well, if we are born as infants uh, with minds that are blank slates, 
uh, how does it come to be that things get written down on it, uh, that we acquire knowledge. And again, it's experience in the world. It refers to working with the information provided by the senses and by other cognitive faculties, such as memory. So once we uh, acquire knowledge through the senses, while some of that knowledge can be stored in our memory faculty, for example, and uh, experience would refer to both uh, the current information as well as these remembered things. So there's a picture of uh, John Locke. And I think there's an important uh, thing to understand now that experience of the world, uh, information through the senses, uh, we are learning about the world in a highly indirect fashion when we work with experience acquired through the senses. And to understand this best, let's make an, a, a distinction here between a distal stimulus, and when you see that word distal, think distance. Something's at a distance. So the distal stimulus refers to an object or event in the world. It is out there. So if I look at, uh, there's a clock in the back window. I can see that clock back there and I say, well, that is a distal stimulus. There is something out there in the world. That is the distal stimulus. Unfortunately, I cannot know directly about that clock. All I receive is proximal stimulation from that clock. I receive patterns of uh, light energy reaching my eyes, uh, reaching my visual sense. Uh, so I do not experience that clock directly. What I experience directly through the senses is a pattern of light wave energy. Uh, so the proximal stimulus, now proximal refers to things that are near. So this is really distant and near. Uh, so the proximal stimulus would be a pattern of energy from the object out there in the world. It stimulates our sensory organs. Uh, and now here's the problem. You really have to uh, latch on to this one because it will motivate much of the discussion uh, in uh, what follows and in people's uh, research. Well, what we would like to know is what's going on out there with the distal stimuli. I would desire knowledge of that clock. I desire knowledge of that sign. I want to know about the locations of the walls in this room and where all of you are seated. However, I don't get any direct information about that stuff. What I get are proximal stimuli, these patterns of light waves reaching my eyes. So the real question is, well, the proximal stimulus doesn't tell us what the distal stimulus is. How do we reconstruct the world of distal stimuli or of distal objects from proximal stimulation received by the senses. Uh, now let's see. Oh yes, here's a fun little example. I like this one. Consider how the size of a visual image of some object depends on the viewing distance. And this is something you probably want to do yourself. We're going to hold up our thumb at arm's length like this. So I'm holding up my thumb at arm's length and I've closed one of my eyes. So I'm using just one eye to help me sort of focus on things. Now I'm going to look at a nearby person and I'm going to see how big that picture is of the person relative, to, it's you, sorry, relative to my thumb. Now I'll say, well, you're actually bigger than my thumb. You're close by and uh, the picture of you that is received on my right eye's retina is in fact uh, bigger than my thumb. Now I'm going to do the same thing for a far away person. I'm now way in the back of the room and I'm afraid you're about the size of my thumbnail. So now I happen to know that that guy way in the back is likely a little bit bigger than you way up in the front. But the picture of you on my eyeball is much larger than the picture of you on my eyeball. Uh, does everybody understand what's going on? The actual proximal stimulation is the pattern of light received by the eye. And I would like to know in this particular example how large a distal object is. And these are in fact objects of about the same size to adult people. And uh, nevertheless, the pattern of light energy is very, very different. Here we get a large picture of light energy. There we get a very small picture of light energy. The proximal stimulus varies considerably. So how can we possibly know about the true size of a distal object of that distant stimulus, given that the proximal stimulation varies so much. Do people see the problem here? 
And the information we're receiving, hey, it's only indirectly telling us about the objects out there in the world. So then the question is, well, how do we reconstruct distal objects from proximal info? So there's this uh, guy named Bishop George Barkley who said that, well, we've got to go beyond just working with sensations, go beyond working with just the proximal stimulation of the senses. We've got to have at least a second stage of processing where we associate uh, stimuli together and interpret them in a meaningful fashion. So here we go. Our senses provide raw input, the sensations, and these are the proximal stimuli in the previous slide. And second, our minds link these sensations to provide a meaningful organization of our perceptual world. Uh, and so we make associations. So if we were to come up with some examples of this first stage in what uh, Barclay is uh, proposing, well, we have sensations, and it could be some patch of green. It could be a note on the piano. It could be the sound of that cough I just heard in the back. It could be a salty taste. It could be the taste of your morning coffee or tea. It could be the touch you feel on your skin. These are sort of basic sensory elements uh, according to Barclay's theory. Now, by themselves, they are not going to tell you what the true size of some object is out in the real world, so you've got to process the sensory information. And in his thinking, well, we make associations. So we could have a spherical patch of green, and it's above a cylindrical patch of brown. And if we associate these elements together, uh, we might uh, have reason to call them uh, some objects uh, in our experience. And in fact, yeah, it might be a tree. You have this blob of leaves up here, and then you have the trunk down here. Yes, it could be a tree. But knowing that something is a tree is only going to happen if we are able to associate the raw sensory data, these uh, very simple sensations. And so Bishop Barclay said, yeah, we've got to process sensory information. We've got to associate it together in ways that will let us uh, learn about true distal objects in the real world. So uh, that's sort of the empiricism point of view. Now there's the nativism, nativist point of view. And a uh, proponent of this is Immanuel Kant. And uh, this German fellow uh, did most of his work in the 1700s, as you can see. And he propounded that in fact, there are categories, that's the word there, the categories used by our minds that help to organize sensory uh, information, that help to organize uh, received proximal stimulation. So for example, and this is not necessarily an easy idea, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Uh, what about space? Where did space come from? Do we directly perceive space in any way? Hmm, what do I mean by space? Well, I look around and I can say, well, there are people seated on the left and there are people seated on the right. There are people seated in the back, people seated forwards. There's also the lights above and the floor below. Somehow we have this 3D space thing going on and I'm now moving through this 3D space. Is that something that we put together through association? of elementary sensations? Well, according to Kant, uh, maybe not. Uh, this is in fact a category, according to Kant, that we are born with. It's innate. We structure uh, stimulation according to the category space, so we put everything in its proper location. Uh, this is in fact a really good idea to think about. Uh, space goes beyond just vision. What about hearing? Could somebody make a sound over in that direction? Oh, that direction too, good. So we have several sounds there. Uh, when you hear a sound, you locate it in the world. In fact, if there is some rumbling, you don't know where it's coming from, it can be very disturbing at times. When you at least know where a sound is, you feel good and you say, oh, it's a such and such, it's somebody clapping, uh, over in a particular direction. Space applies to hearing. Uh, is there any other sense that tells us about space and distance and locations? 
hmm, what are our other things? Well, my body occupies space and when I touch it like this in different places, yes. I can feel the spatial extent of the body. Uh, what are other things about space? Well, a, there's a distance sense aspect to smelling. If somebody were to start eating a banana in the front row, I'd probably smell it and say, oh, there's a banana somewhere. And I'd start smelling and I'd say, oh, it's right here. So yeah, uh, space is organizing sensory input. Is it something that we learn? Well, according to Kant, it's innate. It is a category that is a priori. It comes first. Uh, time. Slipping into the future, as you well know. Uh, what can we say about time? Is it something that we directly sense through proximal stimulation? Well, no. It, at least I don't think so. Is it something that is put together through association? Uh, well, certainly our thoughts about time might be uh, very complex associations, but our primitive experience of time is, say, living in the present moment with past flowing away and future prospects still, in, uh, still ahead of us. Well, Kant would say that is another one of these innate categories and it helps to organize experience so that we can deal with events and process them more effectively. Uh, Causality, again, one thing causes another, uh, and this is something that we're born with. Hmm. So what he would say is experience provides sensory input ordered according to these a priori categories. Now, uh, so much for those guys. Now what we're going to do is talk about the relationship between sensory experience or the psychological experience uh, associated with various sensory stimuli and the physics or the physical stimulation that goes along with that psychological experience. We're going to try to relate physical descriptions of stimuli to the psychological impressions that they leave when received by sensory uh, apparatus. Psychophysics, it relates the characteristics of a proximal stimulus to the quality and intensity of its sensory experience. Uh, basically, uh, it's best to figure this out with examples and the two kinds of examples that we will think about will be uh, thresholds for detecting a stimulus. There are two classes of thresholds that we'll uh, use. These are absolute thresholds and difference thresholds. And absolute thresholds are effectively answering the question, what is the smallest amount of some physical stimulus required for it to be sensed by the organism? So it could be, what is the smallest amount of light that you can detect if viewed in an otherwise completely dark room it could be, what is the intensity of the faintest, faintest sound that you can hear? It could be the answer to, how many sugar molecules must a glass of water contain for you to taste the sugar? Uh, these are all questions about the absolute uh, thresholds uh, for these senses. Uh, the smallest amounts of a stimulus needed in the absence of any other stimulation of that sense. Uh, does anybody have an idea what the answer to that one is? What is the smallest amount of light you can detect if you're viewing that light in an otherwise dark room? Does anybody have an idea? Well, it turns out that we have photoreceptors in the backs of our eyes and the retinas, millions, large numbers of them, and they are designed to absorb light particles. These particles are called photons. Uh, if you shine a light into the eye that presents six or so photons, then maybe five of them will be absorbed by the cellular material in the retina. They will not stimulate a photoreceptor. But maybe one in six of those will get absorbed, will uh, stimulate a photoreceptor and cause it to uh, send a signal uh, through 
uh, various nerves up to the brain. One photon is enough for you to sense that a light has been presented. That's the answer. Uh, that's pretty efficient, one photon. It can't get less than one photon. Uh, what is the intensity of the faintest sound that you can hear? Well, if you have a vibration of your eardrum that is effectively on the order of the width of a hydrogen molecule, then you'll be able to sense that. Now a hydrogen molecule, I don't even know how tiny that is. It's a hydrogen atom now that I think about it. A hydrogen atom is a really tiny thing. It's got to be worse than microscopic. Uh, if you have a vibration of your eardrum on the order of the width of a hydrogen atom, then you will be able to hear that. So that's very sensitive. How many sugar molecules? I don't know the answer. It's on the next slide, I think. Oh, no, that's a drop of perfume. Oh, there it is, good. Vision, a candle flame 30 miles away on a dark, clear night is visible. Uh, hearing, a ticking watch 20 feet away with no other noises. Taste teaspoon of sugar in two gallons of water, smell a drop of perfume in three rooms, touch the wing of a fly falling on your cheek from a height of three inches. Well, these are sort of funny little examples. These are examples that a physicist or a psychophysicist would never use because the actual stimuli are not precisely specified. Uh, so if I hear about, say, a drop of perfume in three rooms, I would want to know, well, how big was the drop? What is the volume of that drop? What is the concentration of the perfume molecules in that drop? Three rooms. Well, how large are the rooms? Are we talking about the, uh, some big movie theater room or this lecture hall? Are we talking about a little closet or what? Uh, we have sort of underspecified the physical stimulus in this table. Uh, a candle flame 30 miles away on a dark, clear night. Uh, candle flame. I'm not certain how bright that is. I bet we can do better by using a light meter to see exactly how many photons that candle is sending in our direction per second. Something like that is a more accurate measure of how bright that light is, physically speaking. A ticking watch. Well, has anybody ever encountered a ticking watch? That's good. Uh, I asked this question. All watches used to be ticking, of course, but now we have digital watches that make no sound whatsoever. And the whole question is, well, how loud is a ticking watch? Or what is the physical stimulus associated with a ticking watch? Well, it could be silent or it could be very loud. Uh, this is unspecified. These are examples of the faintest stimuli that can be detected uh, on an otherwise stimulus-free background. So these are effectively uh, examples of absolute thresholds for detection. Uh, they aren't very well specified though. The other kind of threshold, these are, these are difference thresholds. Uh, we are now asking uh, what is the smallest amount by which two stimuli can differ uh, that can give rise to a uh, just noticeable difference, give rise to uh, perception of that difference. So. Questions are a little bit different. What is the smallest amount that two lights can differ in physical intensity and still differ in perceived brightness? How much change in sound frequency is needed for you to tell the difference between a 256 hertz tone, which is more or less that middle C on a piano keyboard, and a tone of higher frequency? Well, if you know the piano, you know, you play one note, then you play the next note up, you can tell the difference. So whatever the frequency is for that note that's just above middle C, that is bigger than the difference threshold because you can easily tell the difference. It turns out to be a C sharp or a D flat. Uh, so the difference needed for you to say that something is a little bit higher in pitch than middle C is less than whatever that next note is on the piano because you can easily tell that that note is different. Uh, how much sugar must be added to a glass of water that already has a teaspoon of sugar in it so that you can tell the difference? These are now difference thresholds. Uh, so you see what we're trying to do here? We're trying to relate the physical stimulus to our ability to detect uh, either an absolute threshold or a difference threshold and that's why this area is called psychophysics. The detection, the perception is psychological. 
but we're trying to specify the perception in terms of the physical stimulus, psychophysics. So, uh, different thresholds uh, are also called discriminations. We're simply trying to tell two stimuli apart. If the physical difference between two stimuli is as small as possible, and we can still tell the two stimuli apart, then we are measuring a difference threshold. Another word for, excuse me, another term for a difference threshold is a JND, a just noticeable difference. So if people say JNDs or just noticeable differences, they're talking about difference thresholds. The uh, change in physical stimulation required for us to just barely be able to tell that that change is present. Now in a standard psychophysical experiment that would measure uh, our ability to discriminate between two stimuli, uh, we probably would compare a test or comparison stimulus to a standard or reference stimulus. So let's say we're trying to measure difference thresholds for uh, light intensities. What we might do is invite our uh, human subject into a room uh, with a uh, light bulb and the light bulb is attached to a little dial that can make it brighter or darker. Uh, so we have a second one over here that is 100 watts and that is going to be our standard of comparison. So we could say, okay, here's our standard 100 watt light bulb and I want to know how much brighter I must make this other light bulb so that I can see that in fact this other light bulb is now brighter than the 100 watt light bulb. Uh, it would be a 100 watt reference or standard stimulus in this case and the other light bulb would be our test or comparison stimulus. So people have done lots of experiments like this uh, and the person who first systematized a large body of data uh, concerning thresholds of this sort is a fellow named Weber. There's a picture of Weber. Uh, I say it is Weber because it's a German name and that's how you pronounce Weber in German. So Weber came up with a law uh, that relates difference thresholds to the magnitude of the reference stimulus. Here we go. The change in a stimulus required for a difference to be detected increases in proportion to the magnitude of the standard stimulus. So that's sort of what it says in words. This is what it says in equations. That little c means some number, a simple number. It's a constant. In fact, the word constant and in its initial c is what makes us use the letter C here. C is a constant, it's some number. That constant is equal to triangle. What does triangle mean? How many people know what that sort of triangle means? It means change in. Simply means change. Okay, so change in I divided by I. That's what it is. This number C is equal to the change in I divided by I. And now let's go over here and see what uh, these refer to. Capital I is the intensity of the standard or reference stimulus. And in our little example, we had this light bulb that was 100 watts and we would say, okay, that's our reference uh, stimulus. That is 100 watts. That is capital I, 100. The change in intensity required for a difference to be detected well, that's delta I, the change in intensity. And let's say that with a 100 watt light bulb, we needed to turn this other guy up to 101 watts for us to be able to see the difference. Okay, so what is the change in the number of watts that we needed to see that the two light bulbs were different? The change is one. That's the difference between 100 and 101. So delta I in our example would be uh, one, and now we see, well, what's one divided by a hundred? One percent, point oh one. That is a single number and that is this constant, C. And what Weber is saying is that if you choose a particular task, 
such as trying to determine difference thresholds for light intensities, you will more or less always get the same number. Uh, and for our example, that number might be 1% for lights. People have done a lot of work on this and they've come up with, uh, whoops, there it is, all sorts of percentages. Let me skip ahead and then go back to our examples. For vision, the Weber fraction, the constant C in our formula, it's also known as the Weber constant, is 1 60th for a variety of visual light intensity discriminations. And if you express that as a percentage, it's about 1.6. Uh, lifted weights, hmm, 1 50th. In this experiment, you might have one weight here and that would be the standard and then you lift different weights over in this other arm and you say, well, I wonder if that's heavier. And it turns out you need a 2% difference, a 2% increase in the weight to be able to tell that yes, this one is heavier. That's what this is saying in the second row. Lifted weights, 2% change is needed, 1 50th. That's the value of C approximately. Uh, hearing, if you have a tone of middle pitch and moderate loudness, you'll need a 10% change in intensity to know that you have something that is now louder. Uh, touch, smell, taste, etc. Different Weber fractions for different senses. So different changes in a physical intensity are required for us to know that there is a difference in stimuli presented through the senses. That's what that's saying. Weber's saying, aha, for a given task, for a given sense, you get more or less the same number. And so it's Weber's constant. Now, this is obviously something that's going to be on the final, so we need some examples for you. Here we go, problem one. What do we get? Well, we have Betty. Betty, a student in this class, finds that she can just discriminate a light of intensity 102 from a standard light of intensity 100. Assuming that Weber's law holds, how intense must a light be for Betty to be able to discriminate it from a standard light of intensity 200? Or some other light from an intensity of 400? So let's think about this. In an initial experiment, Betty has a reference of 100 and she finds it has to be turned up to 102. So we'd say we need two more units of light intensity for us to see the difference, well, for Betty to see the difference. And that would be 2% or 1 50th. According to Weber, that is a constant, that 2%. So it should apply to brighter, more intense reference lights. So 200, we have to say, well, that 2% change should also work if we have a brighter light of intensity 200. What about 400? Well, that same 2% should apply in that case. So we need to find Betty's Weber fraction C. That's clearly the first step in this, uh, solving this. And the change in intensity is 102 minus 100, otherwise known as 2. The standard intensity is 100. Her Weber fraction in this example is 2%. The idea then is that that number is a constant and it applies to other reference light intensities. So we apply the same Weber fraction, 0.02, to this new standard intensity. And if that new standard intensity is 200, then we want 2% 2 of 200, which is 4. So there it is, 2% 2 of 200 is 4 and the brighter light remember is going to be the reference intensity plus that 4 that's needed for her to tell the difference. So it's 200 plus 4, she now needs a light that's 204 for her to tell that that is brighter than 200. People see how this works? It's actually real simple. Uh, 400, whoops, I don't have 400. We can do 400 in our heads. 
what is 2% of 400? Because that's the amount of change in the reference intensity Betty needs. Eight. So if we're starting at a reference level of 400, what is the intensity of the light that Betty needs for her to just be able to tell the difference? 408. Is this a piece of cake? Piece of cake? Good. Uh, Betty and George in problem two measure their sensitivity to differences in sound intensities in the same experiment. Betty finds that her vapor fraction is 0.05. George finds that his is 0.07. So their vapor fractions are slightly different. George's vapor fraction is a little bit bigger than Betty's. What does that mean about their sensitivity? Who is the more sensitive observer of the two? Is it Betty or George? Well, Betty's vapor fraction is smaller than George's, so she needs less of a change in sound intensity to perceive the difference. That means she's more sensitive. You turn up that TV just a little bit, she'll hear the difference. For George to hear the difference, he has to turn it up more. He is less sensitive. Okay? So do people see how these vapor fractions work? A smaller vapor fraction indicates a greater sensitivity. Less of a change is needed to detect the difference. Good? Okay. So we went through this uh, already. Now we'll look at it with point of view of what is the magnitude of the vapor fraction. And you can see that uh, at least for the tasks that they have chosen here, vision provides a nice, really low vapor fraction. So in some relative way at least, vision turns out to be something for which we're really good at. We're very sensitive. Uh, taste, on the other hand, we need a 33 point uh, three percent change in the concentration of a uh, molecule uh, for us to know that there is a difference, at least in the case of table salt. So that is really a large physical change. So we'd say in some sense we're relatively less sensitive uh, with taste. So people get what the Weber fraction is about? Good. And that leads us right now to Fechner's law. Gustav Fechner, there he is. He actually came up with a law that has logarithms. Logarithms, hmm. How many people like logarithms? Oh, I like logarithms, they're actually pretty good. Uh, let me explain first exactly what his law is saying, then we'll think a little bit about logarithms to try to have it make sense. S is equal to some number k times the logarithm of i, and s over here, the subjective magnitude, i over here is the physical intensity. Forget the other stuff for the moment. What Fechner's law is doing is trying to relate the physical intensity of a stimulus to the subjective magnitude, to the perceived magnitude of the stimulus. Okay, so this is different from Weber's law. Faber was interested in telling the differences between two stimuli. Uh, this is different. Fechner is now saying, well, for some levels, for some level of physical stimulation, what is the uh, perceived magnitude? Uh, what is the subjective magnitude? So the subjective magnitude of a stimulus increases as the logarithm of the physical intensity. So as we turn the brightness of our light up, 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 and up, well, if we were to take the logarithm of its physical intensity, then we would have something that approximates the increase in the subjective perceived magnitude. So you need a logarithmic transformation, according to Fechner. Now, what about this logarithm business? For those of you who have uh, tried to forget this, uh, <laughs> The log, whoops, the log in Fechner's law takes a huge range of physical inputs and turns them into a much smaller range of subjective outputs or subjective magnitudes. So let's say we're using logarithm base 10 
and the input is one. So we have some physical stimulus intensity uh, of value one. What is the logarithm of one? Zero. So the subjective magnitude in this particular case would be zero. So let's turn it up to 10. What's the logarithm of 10? One. Aha. So the subjective magnitude has increased, but it's not increased as much as uh, this input. What about the log of 100? That's two. We have gone in our input from 10 to 100, so we've increased our physical intensity tenfold, but we've only gone from a subjective magnitude of one to a subjective magnitude of two. So there's a much smaller increase in the subjective perceived magnitude. Finally, we go up to 1,000 here. Well, the logarithm of 1,000 is three. And you can see that what the logarithm does is it takes a huge change in physical intensity and turns it into a much smaller change in perceived subjective magnitudes. And here's a fact that we will return to uh, when we talk about vision in particular. The range of light intensities that we are sensitive to is on the order of 10 billion. So the darkest lights that we uh, sense compared to the brightest lights that we sense, they can differ in their physical intensity a billion fold. Now how many uh, log units is a billion? Hmm. Am I touching buttons? Yes, I am. Well, we know that uh, every time we go up a thousand, we have three log units. Hmm. So a thousand is worth three. What comes after a thousand? A million? Is that three more? Yeah, that would be six. What comes as? So we need three more. We need nine to get up to a billion. So the logarithm of one billion would be nine. The logarithm of ten billion would be ten. And the whole idea is when we see the darkest things that we are capable of sensing and we see the brightest things that we are capable of sensing, we don't really say that, yes, my subjective impression has gone up 10 billion fold. Who even knows what 10 billion means? I know I don't. I might say, though, that it goes up tenfold or something like that. And in fact, you can now see what this little guy is here. That is another constant. This constant now has the letter K. And that is some number that gives you the uh, best approximation uh, to the subjective magnitude at any given physical intensity level. So you can multiply it by some bigger number if you feel that the darkest dark and the brightest bright are more than a tenfold increase. If you say that's actually worth about 500 in my mind, then what you could do is say, well, uh, my logarithm gave me the answer of 10, but I think it's actually a 500-fold increase, so I'll multiply 10 by 50. So K would be 50 in our little example, just to get the two things to line up. Do people like this sort of thing? Ha ha ha. I thought so. Good. This is known as psychophysics. This is elementary psychophysics and obviously we're trying to relate physical stimulation to sensation. Our ability to sense things, our ability to perceive magnitudes. What is going to be true in the second half of this course is that I'm going to talk too long about certain things and I am not going to get through the end of the PowerPoints that are posted. This is just true. So if I don't finish our PowerPoint today, don't fret. We'll start in on it on Thursday. Okay. Uh, this is taken into account in our syllabus. There's effectively a free day and I will end up talking enough to cover that free day. So. Signal detection theory. Oh my gosh. What is signal detection theory? Isn't that what we've been talking about already with that uh, Weber's law? Uh, detecting absolute thresholds and detecting difference thresholds? Well, yes, but now we have a theory that takes into account further factors in what determines uh, these thresholds. And this was developed uh, after World War II to help interpret radar signals which of course was an important invention uh, at about uh, the time of World War II. And signal detection theory takes into account two things. One, sensory processing 
of the proximal stimuli received by an observer, this is something we already know about, but two, decision making mechanisms. Somebody receives information through the senses, the person then has to make a decision about uh, what information has been received. Those are the two stages in signal detection theory. And it's helpful to think of a simple experiment concerning detection when you think about signal detection theory. And this slide describes it. We have a large number of trials. And on each trial we are presenting stimuli. And these trials are presenting a barely detectable signal. Well, some of the times they're presenting that signal. We would say that on that particular trial the signal is present. But some of the times they're actually not presenting the signal at all. The signal is absent. So if we are in a sound booth, in an experiment on audition, sensitivity of hearing, uh, then we might have on headphones and we'll be sitting there and one trial might happen and the experimenter's computer will present a little beep in our headphones. So we'd say yes, the signal is present on that trial, but there will be other times when that little beep is not presented by the experimenter. The signal is absent and you can now see what the game is. This, the experimenter will try to figure out the lowest amount of beep sound intensity that is consistent with your just barely being able to hear that the signal is present. Okay, so that's the game. And so then you can say, well, for each trial, sometimes the signal is there, there is a beep, sometimes the signal is absent. There is no beep. The observer in the experiment must respond whether the signal was present or absent. Uh, this can be difficult because the experimenter makes those beeps, makes the stimuli very faint, number one, but number two, all trials have what is known as noise. Uh, if you're doing an experiment uh, on hearing very faint tones in a sound booth, uh, well, there might not be very much noise, but even if you're in an isolated sound booth, uh, you still might hear your heartbeat. How many people have ever heard their heartbeat in a very silent room? Yes, so if you're trying to detect a faint beep, but nevertheless you can hear your heart, that's noise. It's interfering with your detection of the experimenter's beep. So that counts as noise. Now let's say we're in a lecture hall trying to hear the lecturer and there's some beeping outside from that truck that's backing up. That's also noise. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, sources of noise. Uh, but let me say one thing before I get into that. The signal in an experiment of this sort is typically present on only half of the trials. So if we have 100 trials in an experiment, on half those, 50, you will have the beep presented by the experimenter. On the other half of the trials, the other 50 trials, the experimenter is presenting nothing. There's no beep. And the idea is that the experimenter is choosing the trials on which the beep is presented randomly so that the observer, the person listening for the beep, does not know in advance on which trial uh, the beeps are presented. So let's classify responses in such an experiment. Hmm. Trials are of two types. The signal is either present or absent. The observer's response, and remember the observer has to report what he or she thinks is going on, the observer responds, yes, I think the signal was present, or no, I think the signal was absent. So there are actually four possible things, uh, four categories of response in such an experiment, and these categories have uh, standard names. And they are, well, let's see. Let's suppose that yes, the experimenter is presenting the signal on a given trial. There is a beep and the observer says, oh, I think there is a beep. So the signal is present and the observer responds correctly that it is present. What is that called? It's called a hit. Beep. 
that's the term for that one. Now let's see, I think my next one is absent, absent. No, it's absent, miss. There we go. Presence is the truth. The observer makes an error and says it's absent. This is an incorrect response. That's called a miss. So the observer effectively missed the signal. Now, if the signal is absent, but the observer says it is present, that's another kind of error. And that's sort of like crying wolf. Uh, that's making a false alarm. So if the signal is absent, but you say it's there, whoops, that's a mistake. That's a false alarm. Finally, if the experimenter does not present the signal and the observer responds correctly that there is no signal, then you have a correct rejection. So those are the four kinds of responses in this sort of experiment. And hits and correct rejections are correct answers. Misses and false alarms are wrong answers. The observer's job is to try to minimize the number of wrong answers and to maximize the number of correct answers. Does everybody see that that is the case? Good. Now it turns out that a observer's decision making, uh, and the observer is of course trying to um, generally maximize the number of correct answers. Well, it can be altered uh, by adjusting the costs of incorrect responses and the benefits of correct responses. Uh, so this is encoded by a payoff matrix, but uh, intuitively, if you're an experimenter and you want to make a observer less willing to respond that the signal is present, well, what do you need to do? You want a person to say that the signal is present less often. You want the person to say that the signal is present less frequently. Another way to say it is you want the observer to say that the signal is absent more frequently. Uh, how can you get a person to respond in that way? This turns out to be a way that's using a conservative criterion. The person is less willing to say that the signal is present. How do you do that? Well, if you pay the observer uh, one cent for each hit, but pay them, uh, have the observer pay you one dollar for each false alarm, that would work. This is now going to require some thought. Let's see. We have an experiment that seems very mean because the observer who's the subject in the experiment has to pay you, the experimenter, one dollar for each false alarm. I wouldn't want to be a subject in that experiment. That really bites. But let's say we had that ability. Have the observer pay us one dollar for each false alarm. Do you think the observer would want to make false alarms? Not in this economy. No, I don't think so. Uh, so how do we avoid false alarms? Let's go back and figure out how we can avoid false alarms. False alarms are when we have an absent signal, but we mistakenly say that the signal was present. So if we're saying that the signal is present a lot of the time, then we're opening ourselves up to making a false alarm kind of mistake. So what we can do to avoid false alarms is to say that the signal is present less often. Effectively, I'm going to get real conservative. I'm not going to say that that signal is present very many times because, well, I'm just going to get false alarms. So I, I want to get rid of my false alarms. I'm going to stop saying that the signal is present. I will adopt a conservative criterion and only say that the signal is present if it's really, really loud and very, very obvious. So if somebody makes me pay them for a false alarm, I will avoid false alarms. The way to do that is by avoiding saying that the signal is present. And that is known as a conservative criterion on the part of the decision-making observer. Now, how can you, the experimenter, induce an observer to adopt a more liberal criterion? 
And a liberal criterion is one uh, in which the observer is more willing to respond that the signal is present. So, you know, if there's the faintest chance that the signal was present on the trial, then that observer is saying, yeah, I think that was the signal. They're adopting a liberal criterion. They're more willing to say that the signal was present. How can we get an observer to do that sort of thing? Well, we can pay the observer one dollar for each hit and penalize them one cent for each false alarm. So now, if we're getting paid one dollar for each hit, hey, I'm going to try to get a large number of hits. You know, so if I'm going to get a large number of hits, mm, I'm not going to be saying that the signal was absent. If I say that the signal was absent, hey, I'm not getting a hit, I'm getting a miss and a correct rejection. There's no way to get a hit by saying that the signal wasn't there. The only way to get a hit is by saying that the signal is there. So I'm going to increase uh, as an observer the amount of trials on which I say that the signal is present. I'm adopting a more liberal criterion. Does that make any sense? Well, if I'm getting paid a dollar for each hit, I'm going to try to maximize the number of these guys. And the only way to get those hits is by saying that the stimulus is present. So I'm going to have a large number of trials. I'll be saying, yeah, that stimulus is there. Sure, it's there. Dollar, dollar, dollar. Be a rich man. So uh, you can effectively change the payoffs for these uh, categories of responses. And that can uh, induce an observer to adopt a different criterion. And this corresponds to the decision-making component in signal detection theory in our example. So there is the sensation, the receipt of the sensory information, followed by decision-making. And the decision-making is often captured by a criterion. And the criterion is something that the observer uh, applies to the sensory information. And it can be altered according to the circumstances, the payoff matrix, so to speak. Sensory codes. This is now moving on to a slightly new topic away from our detecting signals. What we want to know is how sensory information, which is typically gathered by sensory organs such as the eyes, ears, what have you, is uh, transferred to the brain and processed there in a way that makes it more meaningful. So people talk about sensory codes, the coding of sensory information. And uh, it's coded here as well. The nervous system uses sensory codes to translate a proximal stimulus into neural impulses. Because remember, we have the action potentials traveling on axons. And in fact, there are axons from the eyes up into the brain. And action potentials travel along these. How do we convert incoming light energy into these action potential impulses? Uh, what about hearing? Well, likewise. Uh, Proximal stimuli are captured by organs in our inner ears. Uh, these organs have neurons that are sensitive to vibration. And these neurons will generate action potentials that initiate uh, the sending of auditory information up to the brain. Uh, the question then you can see is how do we convert proximal stimulation, which could be light wave energy or sound vibration, or maybe some molecule that's reaching our nose or our tongue. How can we translate a proximal stimulus into nervous system impulses? Well, the question uh, can be phrased in terms of transduction and then uh, transmission of information. Transduction is the act of converting the proximal stimulus energy into some form of nervous signal. Uh, and that is a very important word, uh, effectively turning physical stimulus energy into a nervous signal. Uh, transduction, we'll have many examples of this coming up. Uh, proximal stimulus intensity is coded by the rates of neuron firing 
and total number of neurons triggered. We talked about the rates of neuron firing earlier. If we have a less intense stimulus, then we'll have relatively fewer action potentials. If we have a more intense stimulus, we'll have a greater number of action potentials, in fact, a higher frequency or rate of firing. We can also ask how many neurons are triggered by a particular stimulus. The greater the number of neurons, uh, well, the more intense the stimulus. So you can see that the firing rate of a neuron codes sensory intensity. The number of neurons firing also codes sensory intensity. And so these are sensory codes used by neurons to signal intensity. Uh, now, in addition to stimulus intensity, you can also say, well, what about stimulus quality? Uh, lights vary not only in intensity, but also in color. So I could have the reds, greens, yellows, and blues. How do we code for color information? What about hearing? Yes, certain sounds are louder than others. They vary in intensity, but there are many other qualities such as pitch, uh, low notes versus high notes. Uh, these uh, are all qualities that we'd like our uh, sensory systems to convey uh, and to process. Specificity theory is something uh, developed by this guy, Hermann Miller, a long time ago. And it says that, yes, different sensory qualities are signaled by different neurons. Uh, and this sounds like it's reasonable. Uh, different sensory qualities are signaled by different neurons. For example, if we have neurons in the back of our eyes and the retinas, sending information up to the brain, well, yes, they're sending information about visual stimulation. Uh, if we have neurons in our inner ears sending information up to the brain, well, uh, if these are in the cochlea, then these neurons are signaling auditory, heard information. The actual interest uh, in this statement comes from situations uh, where uh, funny things are coded. Let's see if we can come up with an example. If I touch my skin right here and press hard, I feel pressure. I'd say fine. There are pressure sensors here and they are uh, signaling pressure. Now would we say that uh, the photoreceptors in our eyes are pressure sensors? We would say no. They are signaling uh, light intensity information. And so what I'm going to do is cover up one of my eyeballs, and I suggest you do this as well. Cover up one eye, please. It, now, press in the corner of the other eye, the outer corner, and you should see this spot on the other side. So I'm pressing in the right corner, and I see this sort of blackish weird spot on the left every time I press. How many people see that weird spot? Okay. So you are perceiving something in response to a pressure stimulus. But are you perceiving just pressure? No, in fact, you are perceiving visual stimulation, that visual spot. And the idea is, is that, well, you are stimulating neurons whose job is to signal visual information. And that's all they're good at generating, is visual perception. That's sort of what Miller is saying here. So that if you stimulate these visual neurons in the retinas, well, it doesn't matter how you stimulate them. It could be pressure, it could be light waves, or it could be something else, I don't know. In all cases, you'll have visual stimulation perceived, because that's what they signal. Now let's see. What this means is sometimes interpreted as, well, there are neurons and they signal a particular quality in this uh, example I just gave, well, some visual quality. And uh, the sensory modalities uh, differ in the qualities that they're able to, uh, that they're associated with. And there are uh, labeled lines within each of these. So we could have labeled lines for color when we're talking about vision so that we have some neurons that signal red some signal green, some signal yellow, some signal blue. 
So each one of these neurons is effect effectively labeled with a particular color perception. Uh, in audition, well, we have this, the different pitches, uh, sort of like the different notes on the piano ranging from low up to high. And we would have different neurons corresponding to each pitch so that these would be labeled lines for pitch. That's the basic idea there. So uh, it's also known that patterns of neuron firing sometimes uh, account for sensory coding. You can't pay attention to just the output of a single neuron to understand uh, what is being sensed. Sometimes you've got to look for patterns of coding. And a very simple example is if you see something that is, say, orange. And it turns out that a very simple theory of how we end up perceiving the color orange is, well, we have a pattern of stimulation in our color neurons, our labeled lines for color. We have the red neurons and the yellow neurons active at the same time. And if we have something that is both red and yellow, we end up perceiving it as orange. So we have red labeled lines, we have yellow labeled lines. If they're acting together, we end up perceiving orange. So we have to uh, effectively look at a pattern of activity across different labeled lines to understand certain things that we perceive. And at this point, I want to say a couple of things. Uh, I see we have, what, about 10 minutes or so? Oh, we have 14 minutes. We have plenty of time. Good. Okay, particular senses. Some of these we'll spend very little time with. And here are the ones that we'll spend very little time with. Kinesthesis. These are uh, effectively the sensory system uh, comprising receptors that are in our muscles, our tendons, and our joints. And they're very good at telling us the configuration of our body at any one moment in time. So this is a very important sense. Uh, you can be certain that there are all sorts of neurons firing each time I take a step, any time I start waving my hands in lecture. Uh, effectively, there's an entire sensory system devoted to saying what the conformation, or the configuration of the body is in space. A second sense, vestibular sense, uh, actually is based on the activity of neurons in the semicircular canals in the inner ear. And they're, you know, to a certain extent responsible for our sense of balance, our ability to keep ourselves upright. If there are disturbances to the vestibular sense, then people can lose their balance. Has anybody ever seen somebody with a disturbance in their vestibular sense? Occasionally, uh, a person will get these little crystals in their semicircular canals and they will sort of throw off their balance. And they'll have to go to a doctor and the doctor will try to turn the person so that the crystal will be dislodged and they will regain their sense of balance. In any event, uh, the vestibular sense relies on signals from neurons in these three semicircular canals, uh, three on the left and three on the right side of the head. And they help us uh, effectively uh, with understanding how our head is positioned in three-dimensional space. It turns out that we have three of these semicircular canals because we want to be able to measure our head's rotation uh, in this direction. This is called pitch, pitching forwards and backwards. Uh, semicircular canals also help us measure the head's rotation like this from left to right and back and forth again. Uh, that is called yaw. And finally, we also have to measure our head's rotation like this, and that's from side to side. That's a roll. 
And so we have three semicircular canals that tell us about the three ways that the head can be rotating, pitch, yaw, and roll. Uh, and so there are neurons in these little canals, little tubes that are uh, sensitive uh, to these sorts of movements. Let's see, skin senses. Well, there are different systems of sensors in our skin, as you're probably aware. And we feel pressure when something presses on our skin. And this is due to pressure sensors, including Ruffini endings. Uh, Ruffini endings are things that are largely in our fingertips. And they are sensitive to the amount of pressure that we, we are applying to something. And this helps us get a good grip on things. So those are pressure sensors or other pressure sensors. Uh, temperature, there are several types of temperature uh, sensor. Some are sensitive to temperature increases. Some are sensitive to decreases. Uh, there are also pain receptors, uh, different kinds. And here's a little picture. What can we say about pain? Pain depends on receptors that respond to temperature damage and temperature extremes. And there are different fibers conveying information from the sensors in the skin to uh, the spinal cord. These include A fibers that respond rapidly to provide rapid signaling of tissue damage. And these are myelinated fibers. So you get uh, sort of an instantaneous feeling of pain. C fibers, uh, these respond in a more slow, sustained fashion. And they're responsible for dull aches after injury. So you can see two different kinds of systems transmitting information about pain from the skin to the central nervous system. Uh, pain is influenced by a number of things, including natural internal painkillers, known as endorphins, uh, and neural circuits. Uh, and neural circuits uh, can act in a way to block pain signals uh, from various pain receptors, nociceptors. Smell. Well, I'm now going to launch in on smell, and smell is going to take too long to do in the next five or ten minutes, so I think this is now a logical place to take a break. When we come back on Thursday, we will start in on smell. If you haven't already started reading chapter four, now's a good time. Uh, thank you for being here. See you next time.